Welcome, everyone. I hope you had a great lunch and you're ready to hear about the exciting world of CUDA and graphics processors. <laughs> um, just by way of introduction, I'm Brian Catanzaro. I just barely finished here at Berkeley uh, in May, so um, I still feel like I'm at home, even though um, I've, I've moved on. So it's gl I'm glad to be back. I'm glad to see you guys and um, glad to talk about uh, this topic, which, I'm, which I enjoy. Um, I want this to be interactive, so if you guys have questions or, or I didn't explain something well, please just raise your hand and, and let me know so that we can, we can learn together. So um, just to give an overview of what I'm going to be talking about, uh, first I'm going to go over some terminology. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of terminology as we change our way of computing. Um, and sometimes people use words in different ways, and so I want to make sure we're all on the same page. I'm going to introduce some terminology. Then I'm going to talk about the CUDA and OpenCL programming models. Um, I'm going to talk about how CUDA is mapped onto NVIDIA GPUs, which is important for uh, getting good performance. And uh, I'll talk about OpenCL um, and, a, and a few other topics along the way. So CUDA is a programming model designed for heterogeneous parallel computing, where you have a multi-core CPU, um, that, which is great at fast serial processing and you have a um, many-core GPU, which is designed for scalable parallel processing, and they work together. So every CUDA program has a portion that is designed to run on the host and a portion that's designed to run on the device. Um, we, we use CUDA to move as much of the um, you know, heavy lifting of the numerical part of the computation onto the GPU because GPUs are more energy efficient and uh, provide higher performance. So what do I mean by multi-core and many-core? Well, Seymour Cray, the famous founder of, of Cray Computers, uh, used to talk about parallelism in this way, that you could either solve a problem with a yoke of oxen or a flock of chickens. Which one would you like? And uh, you, you can sort of think of the multi-core uh, architectures as a yoke of oxen. They are each, execute, each core is optimized for executing a single thread. They're heavyweight. They're really strong. Um, and for some tasks, they are the best tool for the job. Um, plowing a field, I think I want a yoke of oxen. A uh, flock of chickens, not so good for plowing a field, but if you need to find all the worms in a field, you know, they're probably better than a yoke of oxen. Many core um, architectures are, have large numbers of small, simple cores, which are optimized for aggregate throughput, not sequential performance. Um, and this dichotomy is reflected in their design. So I'm kind of a chip die shot junkie. Um, you know, my programming model work, I, I work with programming models, so I'm not an architect by any means, but I like looking at the pretty pictures of, of chips and seeing what I can see. If you look at the top, I've got a die plot of a uh, six core Intel uh, multi-core chip. And you can actually count all six cores. Um, and at the bottom, you can see six pieces of L3 cache. <coughs> Um, and each of those cores is, is pretty big. On the bottom, I have a die plot of uh, NVIDIA's Fermi um, GPU, which is the basis of um, all of the highest end GPUs NVIDIA sells, including the Tesla GPUs, which are intended for um, compute applications and not, uh, not necessarily for uh, playing video games. So um, if you look at the Fermi die plot, there's actually 16 uh, what are called streaming multiprocessors, which are sort of um, the analog to a core. Um, and you can, you can count them on the die as well. Um, there's eight of them at the top and eight of them at the bottom. And that rainbow thing in the middle is sort of the crossbar and all the network infrastructure needed to link those cores together. Um, so the, the physical design of these uh, chips kind of reflects their differences. The, the multi-core has a few very heavyweight threads with a lot of memories attached to each of those threads. You know, you take a look at the size of the L3 cache that's devoted to each of those cores. It's very large. On, in contrast, if you look at the Fermi for each of those um, cores, it's hard to see a big, huge memory. Um, there, there is memory there, but um, it's smaller. And so the, the scale, the, the amount of state per thread is very different. The kinds of computation that you're going to do uh, with these two processors is very different. And that's why they're, that's why we call it heterogeneous computing. Um, the, it's also interesting to look at some of the speeds and feeds of these chips. So the um, Westmere has two has 
six cores. Each core has um, two-way issue and um, four-way SIMD with uh, SSE instructions, and it, the whole thing is running at about three and a half gigahertz. The, the Tesla C2050 GPU from NVIDIA, it has 14 SMs, each of which are two issue, um, but they're 16 way SIMD, so the SIMD is a lot wider. And it's running slower at, at one gigahertz instead of three and a half. Um, the amount of strands or threads of your code that you need in order to fill these chips is very different. So the Intel processor, Filling it, if you if you multiply the number of cores by the number of threads by the number of SIMD lanes per thread, you get around 48 strands per chip to fill the chip. Uh, on on the Fermi, there are 14 SMs, each of which supports 48 SIMD vectors. Each of those SIMD vectors is 32-way logical SIMD, so it's, a, it's about 21,000 uh, threads of execution that you need to have in your program in order to fill the chip. So the kind of program that you write for a GPU is um, much finer grain parallelism at a much more massive scale. Uh, and the CUDA programming model is designed to support that. Um, if we look at the single precision um, floating point throughput, the Westmere is about 200 gigaflops and the Fermi is about uh, a teraflop. Um, memory bandwidth um, is, is uh, also quite a bit larger on the Fermi. Um, we'll talk about that as well later. Um, another important point is, you know, I, I started talking about the memories on chip. Memories really drive programming. So um, when you guys are, are programming parallel processors, in order to get them to work well, you're going to have to think about what, it, what kind of state am I using in each of my threads of execution and how are they interacting. Um, the memory hierarchy on the Westmere is um, a traditional memory hierarchy where each level of the hierarchy um, is, is smaller than, uh, than the one bigger, sort of farther away from the core. So um, as you can see, the register file, there's about six kilobytes of register file architectural state that you can access in your program. There's about 192 kilobytes of L1 cache, about a megabyte and a half of L2 cache, and 12 megabytes of L3 cache. So it sort of gets bigger with every level. Um, on the other hand, the Fermi uh, memory hierarchy is inverted. So the vast majority of the state on chip is in register file, um, where there's about two megabytes of register file. Um, there's about a little less than one megabyte of um, L1 cache or local store, and there's um, about three quarters of a megabyte of L2 cache. So um, this changes the way that you program as well, because you're gonna be focused on using um, state private to the thread, and then using on-chip um, local store to c and L1 cache to communicate between small groups of threads. And beyond that, it's basically a streaming programming model. So why heterogeneity? Why, do, why, why go through all this complexity? So I've kind of overwhelmed you with all these pictures and all these speeds and feeds. Why should we even care? Why not just use you know, what we've always used? Um, or maybe a proliferation. Why not just use a bunch of multi-core CPUs since we have to be parallel, stick them all on the chip and go from there. Well, it, it turns out that different goals of the architectures produce different designs. If you assume that you have a highly parallel workload, you can get a lot better energy performance if you design simpler cores um, that are taking advantage of that parallelism as opposed to um, putting a bunch of heavyweight cores, each of which are, are designed for single thread performance. Um, Multi-core chips have to be good at everything, whether it's parallel or not. Many core chips are designed purpose-built uh, purpose only for very parallel applications. So that produces very different designs. Um, like I said, multi-core chips minimize latency experienced by a single thread. Um, they have lots of really big on-chip caches and memory resources and extremely sophisticated control, predication, speculation, out-of-order engines. Um, you know, the, the latest Intel processor is always a thing of amazement for me. The, the uh, complication that goes on in a, in a single core of a multi-core processor um, is really quite awesome. It, it's, it's really great. Uh, in contrast, many core chips uh, are designed around lots of really simple little cores designed to maximize the throughput of a very large number of threads. If you don't have a very large number of threads in your application and you can't come up with a way to find them, then you will not be able to use a many-core chip. 
Um, they have, they tend to be pretty heavy with, um, you know, floating point resources, ALUs. Um, because multi-threading can hide latency, they kind of give up on caches. Um, at least uh, some some designs do. Some designs have more cache than others, but it, but the amount of cache per thread is always less than a multi-core CPU. Um, so so that's why we're uh, at this point of considering heterogeneity, uh, it, because it, it works, because we can do things that we couldn't without it. All right, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, SIMD parallelism. So in some of the other parallel programming models that are being discussed here at the boot camp, like um, pthreads, MPI, um, some of these other programming models, you've been introduced to thread level parallelism. Um, SIMD parallelism is another form of parallelism that is, is very important and drives a lot of um, GPU architecture as well as the CUDA programming model. So I'm gonna bring it up quickly. Um, you know, si most, uh, well, single instruction multiple data, that's what SIMD stands for. And basically the idea is simple. You have a single operation that you imply in parallel to a, a whole bunch of different pieces of data. So for example, if I had a single instruction um, single data machine, I would just say I, I would be doing one addition. If I had SIMD with a width of two, each of my SIMD instructions would do, uh, would do two additions. Um, and the reason that SIMD is useful is because it uh, is more area and power efficient, um, and we can amortize control overhead over the SIMD width. Um, however, it kind of complicates our life because parallelism is exposed to the developer and to the compiler. And I just noticed that my slide titles aren't showing up on the projector, so I'm sorry about that. Uh, this slide says SIMD neglected parallelism. So um, if, we, if we look at uh, programming models like the ones that, um, some of the others that have been talked about at this boot camp, they tend to not talk about SIMD at all. Um, and that's because it's difficult for a compiler to exploit SIMD directly. How do you deal with sparse data and branches when you're talking about you know, each strand that's mapped onto a SIMD lane and if there's a branch or, or if the data accesses are sparse, um, how do you vectorize that onto a SIMD architecture? Some languages like C, it's just really hard to do. Um, so the common solution is that you either um, forget about the problem and you use a supercompiler that you hope will infer a bunch of mapping of your parallel code onto or loop um, iterations onto SIMD hardware, or you, um, and, and you know, that, that works sometimes, and other times it doesn't. Sometimes if you wanna be very explicit and you wanna perform the mapping yourself, you can instantiate SIMD intrinsics, um, which is uh, one step better than assembly language, but it's still very closely tied to a particular uh, SIMD implementation. Um, and, and it requires a new code version every time there's a new SIMD extension. And there, there have been a lot of SIMD extensions. So the title of this slide is a brief history of x86 SIMD. Um, we start out with MMX, which was 8-bit eight, eight integers. We moved on to SSE, which was four 32-bit integers. Then SSE2, which introduced um, double precision, 2 times 64-bit floating point. SSE3 introduced a few horizontal operations across the SIMD vector like a dot product. Um, then there was a bunch of, uh, of other extensions, the supplemental SSE3, SSE 4.1, 4.2. Um, AVX, which recently came out with Sandy Bridge, now we have eight 32-bit um, entries in a SIMD vector. Um, soon there will be an FMA extension, the Fuse Multiply Add extension to AVX that allows for three operand uh, instructions. Um, and also AVX2 was recently announced um, for Haswell, uh, an Intel processor with 256-bit uh, integer operations as well as um, gather instructions. So there's, so there's, those are the mainline Intel x86 SIMD extensions. Um, there's, there's also been some others from AMD as well as, as from Intel. So, and um, although each of these has brought a great improvement in the um, SIMD efficiency of code that's running on uh, Intel processors, they uh, often require rewriting your code. And um, a lot of times people just don't worry about it. So you just don't worry about SIMD at all um, and hope the compiler works. And um, when SIMD widths were fairly small, that was okay. So um, for example, 
in uh, SSE, the SIMD width is four, so if you don't use SIMD at all, then you're just throwing away you know, three quarters of your throughput. Well, most of the time we're not within 25% uh, of peak performance anyway, so you wouldn't even notice. You'd be bottlenecked by something else. Um, if we go to a 16-way SIMD, like um, the, the Larabee instruction set, which is part of um, the Knights Ferry, uh, Mike, many integrated core architecture from Intel, there we have 16-way uh, SIMD instructions, and so if you don't use them, then you're throwing away 94% of your, your performance. And that point, it starts getting to be more noticeable. Um, and on a lot of many core architectures, SIMD is even more important. So um, this Knights Ferry part has 16-way SIMD. NVIDIA GPUs have 32-way logical SIMD, and ATI AMD GPUs have 64 logical SIMD. So um, uh, you really have to pay attention to, to SIMD parallelism in your programming model. And, and this problem composes with thread parallelism. So if you have a bunch of threads and each of them are supposed to have SIMD, then when you're writing the program, you need to think uh, of all of that parallelism as you write it. And so we need programming models which uh, address both problems. And one of the attempts to do that is the CUDA programming model. Um, so CUDA came out in about 2006, the end of 2006, so it's fairly new as on the scene, um, but it's been around for longer than some. But um, it's designed for, for NVIDIA architectures, many core architectures, lots of SIMD, um, uh, it's designed to help you write scalable parallel programs that run on processors that are very small as well as very large. Um, and uh, the way it does that is by providing a thread abstraction to deal with um, parallelism and SIMD so that you write scalar threads which are mapped onto the SIMD lanes which are mapped onto the array of cores on the processor. Um, CUDA provides synchronization and data sharing amongst uh, small groups of threads so that you can use on-chip memories and be efficient. And uh, you write CUDA programs in C++ with a few small extensions, which I'll show. Um, OpenCL is uh, another programming model that's inspired by CUDA, but is uh, hardware and software vendor neutral. Um, I see Tim Matson here in the audience. Tim, did you give your OpenCL talk already? No, they, they oh, okay. Well, um, so I'm going to cover OpenCL only very briefly. And if I say something wrong, Tim will, will help me out. Um, because Tim is one of the people that um, was on the committee that created OpenCL. Um, so uh, OpenCL has a lot of inspiration from CUDA, but it's um, hardware vendor and software neutral. Uh, so it's a similar, similar programming model in many ways. Um, so this slide talks about the hierarchy of concurrent threads, which um, is, uh, you use when you program a, a parallel program with CUDA. Um, so you, you're, the thought process is I'm going to write a kernel. Each of these kernels is going to be composed of many threads. And all of the threads are going to execute the same sequential program. Um, so it's an explicitly parallel model in the sense that um, right when you start writing a CUDA program, you're thinking about I'm writing one thread, but this thread is going to be one of a team of a very large number of threads. And uh, they're all going to be running the same program. Now, of course, you can branch, right? So if you want some of your program to do one thing and, and some of the threads to do another thing, you can always, um, you, you can always have as part of your program a, a switch that directs them to the things you want them to do. But they all start out at the same place. Um, the threads are grouped uh, hierarchically into thread blocks. So um, small numbers of threads, um, less than 1,000 or so, uh, up to 1,000 threads, are grouped into a thread block and threads inside of a thread block are guaranteed to be able to synchronize. They can communicate. They can share data. Threads that are in different thread blocks um, are not guaranteed to be able to synchronize. They're not guaranteed to be scheduled um, co-resident on the machine at, at, at the same time. And so they, they are not allowed to synchronize or share data. This gives us scalability. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, and threads, as well as thread blocks, are all given unique IDs which you can query in your code. So if you want to say, I want thread zero to do this particular task, then you just say, is my thread index zero? Then go ahead and do that. Okay, so what is a CUDA thread? A CUDA thread is an independent thread of execution. It has its own program counter. It has its own variables, which are um, stored in registers. It has its own state. 
Um, there's no implication about how these threads are scheduled. So like I was mentioning earlier, you can't be sure that any two threads, um, if they're in different thread blocks, that they're actually going to be resident, that they're going to be running at the same time in case you wanted to synchronize. Um, CUDA threads might be mapped onto physical threads as they are on NVIDIA GPUs. They, and I'll talk about that mapping process later, they might be virtual threads. So um, there's a, a company that's making a compiler for um, CUDA programs to multi-core x86 processors. And in that case, the way that you map a thread block is going to be different. You might want to map an entire thread block onto a physical thread on, on a multi-core CPU. So um, the, the programming model doesn't say exactly um, how the threads are, are mapped in general. And uh, so what is a thread block? Well, you can think of a thread block as kind of a, like a data parallel task. Um, all of the blocks in the kernel are going to start out at the same entry point when you launch the kernel, but then once they're there, they can do whatever they want. And you can have the thread block is a nice granularity to send groups of threads off doing different tasks. Um, and uh, as I said before, the thread blocks of the kernel have to be independent tasks. Your program has to be valid for any interleaving of block executions in your code. Okay, so the kinds of parallelism that CUDA supports, trying to map this back to the um, other parallel programming models that ha have been taught at boot camp. Um, there's thread parallelism, parallelism in CUDA. You write a whole bunch of sequential threads. Each of those threads is an independent thread of execution. There's data parallelism. You tend to map your threads onto the data in your problem and have each thread processing a piece of data. Um, you can have data parallelism across the threads in the blocks or across um, the blocks in the kernel. And you can have task parallelism because different blocks in your kernel are independent and they can do different things. And also you can have independent kernels that are executing uh, concurrently in separate streams. I'm not going to go into the details of, of how to do that because uh, it's a little bit complex and kind of an advanced topic. but. Um, but you, you can have task parallelism in that way as well. Okay, so synchronization. Uh, threads within a block can synchronize using lightweight barriers that uh, are provided by CUDA. They're call, it's called sync threads. You can have stuff, uh, threads go to a point, synchronize, and then continue from there. Um, blocks are not, thread blocks are not allowed to synchronize with each other, but they can coordinate. So. Um, there are atomic memory operations that are provided, and uh, in case you wanted to have your blocks coordinate to do some shared task, you can use them. So for example, let's say that you have each of your blocks producing um, a variable amount of data. You're, you're sort of processing a bunch of data, and then you're going to re return uh, some data-dependent amount uh, of result. Now, what you can do is have a shared queue where each of your blocks, once it figures out how much data it's going to be um, outputting, increments uh, a shared queue pointer in, with an atomic increment instruction, and then that will allow each of your blocks to append their data onto the queue in a, in a safe way. So, so thread blocks are allowed to coordinate, but they're not allowed to synchronize. You can't actually presume that any other block is going to be resonant. Um, there's an implicit barrier between dependent kernels. So when you, when you do kernel launches, which you do from the host, so from the CPU side, you're, it's basically a special function invocation, and each of those are presumed to complete before the next one starts. The function uh, invocations are asynchronous, so they will return before the computation has completed, um, but uh, you're guaranteed that the next one won't start until uh, the one before it has completed. So blocks must be independent. Uh, I've mentioned this a couple times, but I'm just going to say it again. Uh, any possible interleaving of thread blocks should be valid because each of your thread blocks are presumed to run to completion without preemption. They can run in any order. They can run concurrently or sequentially. Um, blocks can coordinate but not synchronize. A shared queued pointer is, is great, but a shared lock is bad because you can easily uh, bring the machine to deadlock. Um, but this independence require, requirement on thread blocks makes you write scalable programs. Um, and to give you an idea of the kind of scalability um, that a CUDA program might 
see in its lifetime, here's uh, the number of SMs in, in uh, NVIDIA's product line. At some point I took a snapshot and there was, there was GPUs down with one SM and there were GPUs with 30 SMs. CUDA allows the exact same binary to target all of these and run efficiently on all of these. Because the thread blocks are independent, that means your program has to be scalable. It also means your program has to be very parallel. Um, so this is kind of the hello world of CUDA uh, vector addition. So I'm gonna compute a vector sum C equals A plus B. And what I'm gonna do is assign a thread to each element of vectors A and B, which I presume to be of the same length. I'm gonna you know, do the sum and, and store it to um, vector C. Um, so I have a CUDA kernel it's just a normal, normal C function except for two things. One is it's decorated with this underscore, underscore, global, underscore, underscore, decal spec decorator. That says this is a um, CUDA kernel. Um, and CUDA kernels are not allowed to return anything, so they're always void. Um, if you, the results that you are going to produce during execution, you're going to um, give as a pointer to some buffer on uh, the, the device memory that you're then going to fill up. So you can see the inputs to vec add include both the vectors for the input as well as uh, a vector for the output, uh, a float, float star. Um, so the second line of the kernel, I say uh, I'm looking for um, uh, uh, my global index in the array of threads that's launched when I launch the kernel. So I'm sort of computing that in my block index um, times the number of threads per block plus my thread index, and then uh, perform my computation. So that's, that's the kernel. Um, the host code to launch this is, is right here. Uh, it's just a single line. Um, what I'm saying here is I'm going to launch, if I have uh, n elements in my vectors, I'm gonna be launching uh, them in blocks of 256 threads in this example. So the uh, number of thread blocks is n over 256. Let's presume it's evenly divisible for now. Um, and then the number of, of threads per block is 256. And I put those launch parameters in this special CUDA uh, triple chevron syntax that um, tells, the, tells the compiler this is a CUDA kernel launch. Uh, treat it slightly differently from a normal function call. So that's it. That's all you have to do um, to launch a CUDA program. All right, so um, let's talk about the memory model. Um, each thread that you write is going to have its own local memory space, which is private. Other threads aren't allowed to see it. Um, typically, I don't interact with the local memory of a thread when I'm writing CUDA code. That's something the compiler does if I need to, for example, spill and fill um, uh, values because I've run out of space in my register file, or if I need to do recursion or something else. The compiler will use that um, local memory space for a stack. Um, uh, but, it, but it is there in case you need it. Um, there's also per block shared memory, which is uh, mapped on chip and is very fast. Um, it's useful for communication between threads in a thread block. Um, the memory model, we have a set of sequential kernels. Um, each of these kernels is comprised of a grid, like I was saying, and they um, are presumed to run sequentially. The data that they produce and consume lives and resides in device memory and it persists across kernel calls. So one kernel can create something, another kernel can consume it. Um, the memory model is a, a heterogeneous model where you have host memory, which is the normal memory space that you work with when you write any C++ program. Um, and then you have device memory, which sits on the device and you're going to be using uh, special mem copies to move data back and forth. So it's called CUDA mem copy. Uh, and it looks like this. So here's a, a hello world of how to manage data on the host. So this is host code that's running just on the CPU. Um, so let's say I have my N, I, I, I'm you know, making the example easy for myself. So I've chosen uh, my N to be a multiple of 256 because um, I'm gonna be launching my work in groups of 256 threads. 
Um, I can create data on the host using whatever mechanism I want to allocate data on the host. Here I've used a, st a straight C malloc. Um, I can allocate memory on the device using a CUDA malloc. Um, and then I can use CUDA memcopy to move data from the host to the device. Once it's there, I can use it in a kernel. So then I run this vector add and it, it's going to use that data I just placed on the, on the device memory. And then at the end, I can copy the result back to the host and then use it um, for whatever I, I, I need to on the host. So this, this data is managed explicitly. Um, there are tools that make it a little easier that I'll talk about uh, if I have time. Okay, so using per block shared memory. Um, there are variables shared across the block. The syntax for that is you just put this underscore, underscore, shared, underscore, underscore, decal spec, um, when you declare them. Um, there, there, you can also use it for scratch pad memory, so if I want an array, it's, it's very common to have an array that is gonna be um, sized according to the number of threads that are gonna be in the block, and each of the threads is gonna put their own result into this scratch pad, and then the threads may um, synchronize, and then um, you pick up the, the result from another thread. That's how you do communication and move on from there. Um, Per block shared memory, when it's mapped on a GPU, is um, faster than the L1 cache and slower than the register file. Um, and it's relatively small. So the register file in aggregate is two to four times larger than the per block shared memory on the chip, which means that you want to use registers for as much as, much as you can. You use share, per block shared memory mostly for communication between threads. Okay, so talking about some of the other minimal extensions to C uh, that, that CUDA provides, um, there are declaration specifiers to indicate where things live. So, for example, um, you know, functions can live uh, on, the, on the device, be called from the host. Those get a global tag. Functions that live on the device and are called by the device get a device tag. Data that sits uh, always in device memory gets a device tag. And data that sits in per block shared memory gets a shared tag. Uh, we talked about the function, uh, the kernel launch invocation syntax uh, earlier, where you have this triple chevron and you give the, the thread block configuration of your grid. And uh, each of your threads has access to a set of special variables that the CUDA runtime provides that tell it who it is. So what its thread ID is, what its block ID is, how many threads there are in the block that has been launched, how many blocks there are in the grid that has been launched, all those you can access in your program. And then there's a few intrinsics like sync threads um, that, that do various things. So sync threads is, again, the, the um, local barrier synchronization mechanism for thread blocks. So um, CUDA GPUs provide um, uh, an array of features that you might want in your code. Um, for example, double and single precision floating point as well as integer support, all of the standard C integers. Um, standard mathematical functions that are, you know, you might be familiar with from math.h. Um, atomic memory operations um, for um, some particular data types, uh, and they can work on data that's in either global memory, which is d the device memory that's off chip, or on shared memory, which is on chip. Okay, CUDA runtime support. The CUDA runtime provides us with um, explicit memory allocation um, operations that give us pointers to GPU memory or free memory on the GPU. Um, memory copies of various kinds and then some interoperability things in case you're doing data visualization. GPUs are built for visualizing data, so it's nice to be able to just take the result of a computation, throw it into an OpenGL texture, and then um, show it on the screen. That can help. Um, help with your programming. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk uh, briefly about OpenCL and how all of the things that, that I've been talking about relate to OpenCL. So OpenCL is um, a, it's, uh, run by the Kronos group, which runs OpenGL, so it's a vendor independent group. Uh, it has support from AMD, both with their CPUs and GPUs, as well as NVIDIA and um, Intel. Uh, Intel uh, recently has released uh, OpenCL runtime for CPUs. Um, imagination Technologies, which designs the GPUs that go into many cell phones, including the iPhone and um, like TI OMAP and you know, many, many other um, SOCs for cell phones. 
um, they are also on board. So OpenCL has, has a lot of support from the industry. Um, the OpenCL data parallel execution model mirrors CUDA, has a little bit different terminology. Um, I have a slide that corresponds them a little bit so you can get started um, if you're interested in using OpenCL. Um, one of the great things about OpenCL is it has a rich task parallelism model. You can describe your program in terms of a set of um, operations and describe the dependencies between them and the runtime can walk that in parallel, um, which, which I think is really nice. Um, so that, that allows you to, ha uh, to exploit task parallelism uh, in a very nice way. Um, this is kind of an eye chart just to um, bring CUDA and OpenCL terminology and correspondence. Um, I mostly put this in here for reference, um, so you can look at my slides if, you, if you'd like to. But um, some of the names are slightly different, so instead of a thread, OpenCL calls it a work item. Instead of a thread group, it's called a work group, or a thread block is a work group. Um, some of the memories uh, spaces are the same. Some of them are slightly different. Um, some of the decorators are slightly different. But it, but it's um, it's it's close enough that if you want to transition from one to the other, it's not so bad. Um, one of the things to keep in mind about OpenCL is that each runtime has a lot of flexibility in how it's going to map the program onto the hardware. And SIMD issues, in particular, uh, impact the kinds of programs that you write. So. Um, if you're using the AMD GPU OpenCL runtime, the um, runtime will vectorize work items across um, the 64-way SIMD of the machine, but not across the um, four- or five-way VLIW that, uh, that the AMD architecture has inside of each SIMD lane. So this means that you actually want to write um, vectorized code if you're targeting an AMD GPU that, that uses um, data types that are already vectorized, like float four vectors. So you're writing sequential code, but your sequential code is SIMD parallel. Um, AMD CPU runtime uh, also doesn't do vectorization, so you should use float four vectors or perhaps float, float eight once um, AVX appears. Uh, the Intel OpenCL runtime, I didn't put it on the slide, but I believe that it um, can support vectorization across um, AVX lane so that you can write scalar code and have the runtime auto vectorize for you. Um, and that's what the NVIDIA OpenCL runtime does as well, and also the CUDA runtime. So if you're writing OpenCL code for and you're targeting an NVIDIA GPU, you tend to write scalar code where each thread is just a single thread of execution. You don't have to um, parallelize your data structures, um, whereas for, for, um, for AMD architectures, that tends to be a better idea. So um, so some of these are things are exposed to the programmer, which is why I bring them up. Now I'm going to talk about how CUDA code uh, and also OpenCL code, but I'm going to use CUDA terminology just because I'm more familiar with it. Um, I'm going to talk about how CUDA code is mapped onto NVIDIA uh, processors. Um, so the imperatives for efficient CUDA code, firstly, you need to have abundant fine-grained parallelism. So if, you're, if your problem, if you just can't think of a way to get you know, several tens of thousands of threads out of your computation, then, um, you know, targeting an NVIDIA GPU is probably not going to be very productive. Um, you want to maximize your on-chip work. So you want, um, because the, the on-chip memory is much faster, um, you want to uh, try to keep as much of your data access as on-chips. So that means you use per block shared memory. You want to minimize your execution divergence. So um, as I said, the, the runtime is going to take groups of threads and map them onto the SIMD uh, hardware of the machine, um, but that's going to be less efficient if your threads are doing different things. So it'll work. Your program will still be correct, but uh, the uh, performance will, will decay basically as a function of the divergence inside of your SIMD vectors. I'll talk about that more in a second. Um, and you also want to mim minimize memory divergence. So as your threads load and store data from memory, you want to try to keep that, those loads and stores um, coalesced and, and sort of uh, vectorized so that um, the, the uh, memory subsystem can deal with them efficiently. And I'll talk about that uh, also in greater detail in a second. So how does CUDA get mapped to NVIDIA GPUs? Well, the um, the mapping process is designed to be functionally forgiving, so the first priority is to make things work. The second priority is to get good performance. Um, so you can write CUDA code that um, will work, it just may be slow. Um, 
in order to get good performance, you're going to have to understand this mapping process in a little bit greater detail. So each thread of your CUDA program gets mapped onto a SIMD lane of the processor. Um, groups of threads are going to be ganged together in what NVIDIA calls a warp. This is equivalent to a SIMD vector. On NVIDIA architectures, it's 32 threads. So all of your threads are going to be chunked up into these warps. Um, the, the, uh, this is a logical SIMD width. This doesn't actually specify how it's executed in hardware. but to a programmer, this is the number that you think about. Um, each of your thread blocks, the model is once it gets, uh, you, you initiate a grid of thread blocks, so many, many thread blocks, many more thread blocks than um, can fit onto the, pro onto the GPU. The hardware has a load balancer that takes um, thread blocks from your launch and schedules each of the thread blocks onto an available streaming multiprocessor. Each of your thread blocks is going to sit there and process on that same streaming multiprocessor until it's done, at which point it'll be evicted and another thread block will take its place. So um, peak efficiency requires you to have multiple thread blocks scheduled onto every SM so that the amount of parallelism that you want is greater than the number of SMs in the chip that you're targeting. Um, so the GPU is very deeply pipelined to maximize throughput, and this means that um, the performance depends on, uh, often depends on the number of thread blocks that you can get um, resident on the processor at a given time. Um, and the, um, that mapping process depends on the resources that each of your thread blocks require. So um, if you have a program that uses a lot of register space, then you may be register file limited and the hardware may not be able to schedule as many thread blocks onto each SM as it could if your program had fewer registers. Um, same thing with shared memory. So if, you're, if your program uses a lot of shared memory, you're going to be limited by the uh, number of thread blocks that can be simultaneously scheduled onto an SM. And uh, it's often worth trying to, to play with those, uh, trying to change your code just a little bit to uh, make, make sure things fit. If you're targeting a uh, Fermi, GPU, then you want to have about 20 registers per thread, and you can get the, the compiler to tell you how many registers you're using in order to get uh, full occupancy. Um, the CUDA profilers and uh, uh, other information that you can use to um, figure out how well your code is being mapped onto the machine reports a number called occupancy. I find this number to be uh, sometimes mysterious to new CUDA programmers, so I'm going to explain it mostly for reference here. Um, the, this is going to be on the website, so you can take a look at it if you're trying to figure out um, what that <coughs> occupancy number means. But basically, it, it just means what I said before. You're going to be limited how many uh, simultaneous thread blocks you can map onto an SM is limited by how much register file space each of them uses, how much shared memory space each of them uses, the, number, the restrictions on the number of warps that can fit on an SM at a given time. And you sort of combine all those constraints and, and come up with um, uh, an occupancy figure. Um, OK. So let's talk about SIMD and control flow. Um, the, the hardware and the runtime vectorize your threads across the SIMD lanes of the processor. Um, but, and, and so if there's divergence and reconvergence that happens, you don't have to worry about that. What I mean by divergence is if you say, I want everybody whose thread is less than, say, 10 to go do this. Else, if you're greater than 10, go do that, right? So the, all the control flow has diverged. Your threads in the same thread block, even in the same warp, the same SIMD vector, they may be doing different things. Um, the hard roll will take care of that for you, and, and it'll work. Um, but it, you know, as, as I said before, it'll get slower and slower as you diverge. When you reconverge, uh, performance will, will get better. Um, there is a, an important caveat. You can't have a synchronization inside of divergent code. So if you, um, if you write a program and all of your threads are doing different things and you want them to synchronize, you need to sort of terminate the uh, whatever nest of if-then-elses that you've got in your code and get back to a point where all the threads are together again before you synchronize. Um, otherwise, you'll hang the machine. Um, all right. So let's talk about uh, memory. I find that you know getting my CUDA programs to perform well usually involves optimizing my usage of memory. 
Uh, and there's a good reason for this. Um, Kathy Yellick, one of the professors in the PAR lab, um, has this great quote uh, that a many core processor is defined as a device that can take a compute bound problem and turn it into a memory bound problem. And this is kind of an analogous to some of the jokes that people said about supercomputers um, turning everything into I.O. bound problems back in the day. Um, and, and it's really true. I mean, if you look at the, at, at sort of a logical plot of uh, a, a multi-core processor and a many-core processor, you have so many more agents that are contending for the same DRAM socket on a many-core processor. There's just so many cores and they all are, there's only, there's still only one DRAM interface that they're all trying to go through. So you really have to pay attention to how you're using that memory bandwidth. It's often a key performance limitation. And it tends to dominate my performance tuning. So how do we how do we tune memory usage? You know, it's kind of uh, esoteric. Most programmers don't want to think about this at all. Um, and the way that I think about it is that virtually all processors these days have SIMD memory subsystems. So memory is SIMD also. So let's say that I have some piece of memory and I want to access element zero. Okay, so I'm going to tell my processor to go fetch element zero, um, but what it's actually going to fetch is a cache line that contains element zero as well as a bunch of other things. And that the amount of data that's fetched every time I do a small memory access is called the cache line width. Um, this, so this has two effects. The, the fact that when you ask for one small piece of memory you get a, a chunk it has two effects. One is that sparse access wastes memory bandwidth. So Let's say that um, I, I have two threads and one of them is asking for element zero and one of them is asking for element four, but I don't ever want to access one through three or five through seven. Well, in this fictional example, my processor, because of the way the cache lines are configured, I'm going to be loading element zero through seven, even though I only wanted element zero and element four. And in, th in this case, although I only asked for two words, I ended up loading eight, so I am throwing away three quarters of my memory bandwidth. So, so that's one of the effects. Um, the other effect, which is a little bit less important, is that um, unaligned accesses also waste bandwidth. So let's say that I, I, I wanted to access four contiguous elements, but they weren't aligned to the cache line. In this case, I'd still be loading two cache lines, which throws away half my bandwidth. So it's, um, now um, that, can, that is easier to mitigate using caches than uh, sparse accesses, but it's still something to think about. And so um, when you write code, you want to try to write code that accesses memory in a way that, is, that fits with the SIMD nature of the memory subsystem. Um, so the way that it works on GPUs, you have all these independent threads and they're all running and they all kick off, uh, say, a load. Um, the, what happens is the hardware inspects like the set of memory requests that are coming from uh, the set of threads that are running concurrently, and then figures out how many cache lines that's going to touch and then pulls all those cache lines in. And that's called coalescing. So, um, and this is all done dynamically. So, um, the optimal case for the coalescer is when your threads present uh, data accesses that are all um, unit stride and aligned. So, dense accesses that are aligned. Um, and that's, that's what you try to do with your data structures. Um, so how do we do that? Um, so let's, let's imagine that you have a three by three matrix. Um, you know, it's a two dimensional structure, but memory is inherently one dimensional, at least that's how we think about it when we're programming. So we can choose to lay it out in a row major index. Um, and as you can see, I've taken sort of my cartoon here and you, you see I can sort of rasterize the rows. So I go um, the top row, then the second row, then the third row sort of concatenate them together into this vector that represents the original two-dimensional matrix. Um, that's called row major access. Now, if I'm mapping a program in parallel so that each thread is working on a row of this matrix, um, that's actually a bad ordering. That's why I have a little frowny face. If you think about it, so thread zero would be grabbing the top left element, thread one would be grabbing the middle left element, and uh, thread two would be grabbing the bottom left element. Um, in the row major ordering, those are not dense and strided. Those are going to be sparse, and so that's going to waste bandwidth. 
So often you're going to want to lay out your data structure in a different ordering. For this particular data structure, I'm going to want a column major ordering, um, where basically you store the data kind of transposed, in, uh, so you go kind of column, go column by column, and um, and also you're going to want to pad it so that the the data is aligned. Um, to sort of illustrate this more concretely, I have this um, sparse matrix vector multiply example, but I'm actually running out of time, so I'm going to skip through it, and you can look at it yourself if you're interested later on. Um, let's see, going ahead. Um, another common idiom that you'll do as a programmer to try to improve your memory access patterns is transition from structures of arrays uh, formats to arrays of structures formats and vice versa. Um, typ typically the um, structure of arrays format, um, which is the one on the right, is, is going to be higher performance because you're going to be accessing fields of, a, of uh, each array together. Um, and, and sometimes your data is presented to you in one form, you need to do an effectively a transposition, change it into the other form. Uh, this can save you a lot of, of time and you can use um, showed memory to perform those transposes. Okay, so that's all I'm going to say about memory tuning. It's, a, it's an important topic and, a, you know, really treating it well would take a lot more time than we have. But um, just want to bring, bring your awareness that that's usually when I try to get my CUDA code to run fast, that's the first thing I do. So I'm going to talk about how do we make um, CUDA programming a little bit more productive. Um, and I'm going to evangelize for um, something called thrust um, which is now a part of the CUDA SDK, and uh, you know most CUDA installations will have it. If, if your CUDA installation doesn't have it, you can download it from Google Code. It's free. It's just a set of C++ um, headers that you can include in your application. Um, and it's a set of C++ libraries for CUDA programming that are inspired by the standard template library that many C++ programmers are already familiar with. Um, it has a lot of algorithms that uh, work well on data parallel hardware like uh, a many core GPU, such as reductions, sorts, um, reduced by key, which is kind of a segmented reduction, um, scans. Um, using thrust really helps out with the overhead of managing different memory spaces. So earlier I showed you a bunch of, um, you know, uh, um, CUDA mem copies that are going to be moving stuff back and forth and CUDA malloc's. If you use Thrust, you don't have to worry about that. You just declare your data and you use it. It's really nice. And um, Thrust also includes an OpenMP backend for multi-core programming. So you can take a Thrust program and um, recompile it for a, a, a multi-core CPU if you'd like to do that. Um, okay, so this is kind of the hello world of Thrust. Um, you include a bunch of headers. Um, you create a host vector. Host vectors are uh, basically data structures that live on the host. Um, you can call things like generate. In this case, I'm passing the standard lib, the C standard lib rand function to generate. So I'm saying I want you to run this function for every element of this range that I'm giving you and uh, store the result uh, in the range. So that would initialize your host vector with a bunch of random numbers. You can transfer the data to the device just by declaring a device vector and then assigning it from the host vector, and that act of assigning um, using basically C++ um, templates is going to trigger the CUDA mem copies and so forth that you're, that you're going to need. And the declaration is going to do the CUDA malloc, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, then there's algorithms like sort, um, so you just say sort my data, and uh, you know that the, the, uh, this particular implementation of sort is extremely fast and it represents an entire PhD dissertation from someone at the University of Virginia. So, um, and, and it's really quite an amazing piece of code. I am really glad I don't have to write it myself. That's the great thing about libraries. So I, you know, many of the things that you would want to do um, are going to exist already in this library, and that's why it's really productive to use it. Um, transferring data back to hosts is really easy. Um, so here's, for example, um, Saxby that's written in Thrust. I'm, I'm sorry that the projector is cutting off um, uh, stuff from, the, from this code example, but basically instead of writing a global function where you do the per element operations, you write a function object that is going to um, do your per element operations as a, you know, a C++ operator method. It's, it's okay. It'll be fine. Um, 
the, uh, so, so you can see this sort of operator parentheses method is going to take you know, two elements from two vectors. It's going to scale one by the scalar and then add it to the other one. When you create this function object, you pass in the state that's going to be shared across all of your invocations of the function object. So that scalar is passed in in the constructor. And then here at the bottom, it's kind of cut off, but you can imagine what it says. There's a transform. You give it the range of the x vector and the y vector, and then you give it the function object that you create, and that's going to kick off your, your computation for you. Um, so Thrust is a great, great, highly productive way of programming GPUs, and I, um, I use it myself all the time. So it's a good place to start if you're a new, a new programmer. Okay, so in summary, I'm wrapping up here. Uh, many core processors provide useful parallelism. Um, you, a lot of us that have used them have gotten um, really good performance that we've been really happy with, um, and the programming effort has been okay. Um, there are programming models like CUDA and OpenCL, which uh, allow us to use these many core uh, processors in a heterogeneous environment. Um, they help us with SIMD. They encourage us to write scalable algorithms and implementations and uh, go check out Thrust. It's a great way to um, start CUDA programming. If you're just getting started, you'll be much more productive than I was when I was first starting. So that's it. Uh, any questions? Yeah. Uh, 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 I have a question on the CUDA SDK on Linux. Uh, yes. On this particular uh, PC, uh, it has uh, two graphic units, yes. a, a native, uh, and so I know that this doesn't work in Linux. There's something proprietary about it. Well, it, it does work in Linux. Linux. It might be a little bit harder to configure, but yeah, it definitely can problem. work. I, I hope so. I haven't tried it yet, but it does. You can have a uh, 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 CUDA SDK uh, and use it without the graphics even. I mean. One doesn't um, need graphics. Well, so you need to, in order to use uh, NVIDIA's CUDA SDK, you have to have an NVIDIA GPU. Uh -huh. um, One of them is. There, there is, like I said, an effort to make uh, a CUDA runtime that runs on Intel processors, uh, and there's also OpenCL that runs on, on everything. I think PGI is shipping. Aren't they? I don't remember if they're shipping or not. They've um, announced it. At least. They've, an, they've announced it, right. So. Um, Right, the Portland Group compiler. Um, so, um, so if your laptop has a GPU, you can use it. If you have multiple GPUs in your laptop, you can access that through the CUDA SDK. The easiest thing to do, essentially, what I normally do is just set my default GPU for a single host thread to be one of the GPUs, and then all my CUDA calls will just be routed to that particular GPU. Um, you, you can also do more advanced things where you sort of juggle multiple GPUs from a single host thread if you'd like the APIs there. Maybe you can explain that to me offline yeah. or, or onla online if you think it's worth it. But <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah. My um, oh, that's a good reminder. Um, here's my email address. So um, if any of you guys have questions, uh, feel free to send me an email. I'd, I'd love to uh, do what I can to to help you out. Yeah. Question in the back. Today morning, uh, Professor Quetzer was talking about design patterns, and yesterday we were um, learning about the 13 dwarfs, right? So in that sense, uh, do you have any intuition that what a, what subset of those dwarfs would be really good for the many core and CUDA programming style? Mm -hmm. Would all of them be, or a subset of those? Well, um, I think that is a really fascinating question, and I think that um, our answer to that question evolves with time. Um, I would say the first dwarf that people started exploiting on the GPU is dense linear algebra because it's very vectorized and it maps very cleanly to vector architectures like many core GPUs. Um, with time, with more sophisticated uh, programming models and just more understanding of how to program GPUs, other dwarves have started to be um, productively exploited as well. So um, sparse linear algebra tends to work pretty well on GPUs. Um, structured and unstructured grids works well. Um, uh, I'm going to have a hard time remembering all 13 of them right, right off the bat. But um, Monte Carlo methods, uh, you know, a lot of people use GPUs for Monte Carlo methods. Um, 
uh, you know, graph algorithms even, there's, there's, there's a lot of people um, exploring how to write graph algorithms for GPUs. So I think, I think most of the dwarves, if they're, if they're parallelizable, uh, if you can find a lot of fine-grained parallelism in, then they'll, they'll work on GPUs. Some of them will be a lot more straightforward than others. And uh, you know, if you're doing just dense linear algebra, then you won't have to write much code at all because there's a lot of libraries that already do the hard work for you. So a question from online. Is it possible to uh, start uh, multiple kernels on uh, an NVIDIA GP GPU? Uh, yeah, so the question, can we run multiple kernels? Um, that feature is new. Um, it, it first came about with the um, Fermi generation of GPUs which do support, it's called concurrent kernel execution. Um, in order to do that, you have to um, write your code in a way that exposes that parallelism to the runtime. So essentially, you have to have your kernel launches in different CUDA streams, and each CUDA stream is considered a, a set of sequential um, uh, kernel invocations. So if you, if you want them to run concurrently, you put them in separate streams. Um, now, that doesn't actually guarantee that the hardware is going to execute them in in parallel because um, the scheduler in the hardware has a lot of freedom uh, as to what to actually do. But for example, say that you had one kernel launch that was too small to fit the GPU and you had another kernel launch that by itself was too small to fit the GPU. If you were able to put those in separate streams, you would have a better chance of the hardware actually deciding to fill the GPU using um, you know, elements from both kernels. Um, so, so that you would use the CUDA streams to do that. Does NVIDIA have any debug tools? Or yes, how do you get there are quite a lot of debug tools. Um, so the, the um, debug tool that I use most often is Printf. Um, and uh, uh, Printf actually works in CUDA now. It didn't used to. So that, that was kind of a, a big, wonderful thing for all of us when Printf started to work. Although, um, you know, I'll caution you that when you have 30,000 concurrent threads and they all start printing stuff out, it, the ordering of the stuff that comes out is not guaranteed to make any sense. So you have to be careful. Um, there are also um, interactive debugging tools. So on Linux, there's a CUDA GDB that allows you to um, breakpoint threads and, and step through them. On Windows, there's um, sort of the Rolls Royce of GPU debugging tools. It's called Parallel Insight. It works with Visual Studio the way that other debugging tools do. Um, it's very heavyweight, but it's also very awesome. It allows you to, you know, see everything all the time, figure out everything, step through everything. It's um, it's it's quite amazing. So there's there's a range from the humble and easy to use printf <coughs> to the awesome and formidable Parallel Insight. Um, I have a question here. When you write uh, CUDA code uh, yourself, do you usually target a particular um, class of devices and sort of assume a particular shared memory size and kind of yes. optimize the occupancy for that? Or yes. is there a good way to try to do something more general for future devices? That's a great question. So um, you do have to take account into account the specifics of a particular device if you really care about performance. Um, and the way that, um, so you, you tell the compiler when you compile your program what class of device you want to target, and the compiler will generate code specialized for that device. Um, now, uh, if you want to write code that is more general, the best way that I've seen uh, involves a lot of C++ template metaprogramming. Um, I don't know how much you're a fan of C++ template metaprogramming, but essentially you can write your code in very generic ways where all the constants end up being bound into um, structs or other pol policy objects that you can then instantiate using the C++ template metaprogramming system to sort of create new versions of your code that may be parameterized in different ways. And so that is the, that's the best way that I've seen, like for example, the sort code um, <coughs> is highly tuned to every architecture and the way they do that is they expose all the decisions in these structs and then they instantiate their code with a particular struct and tune over the different parameters. So that's, that's uh, the best way I've seen. Am I wrong in thinking that if you just have one master processor on a chip like uh, Prism that did the runtime, you can actually throw out 
Yeah, so the question is, um, am I wrong in thinking that if there was a small processor on the GPU itself, a traditional CPU, then you could run the entire program, including the host, on the GPU? And um, I don't think you're wrong in thinking that. Um, NVIDIA hasn't announced any products uh, that, that do that, but um, the, the benefit of some arrangement like that would be you don't have to transfer data back and forth between the host and device. Now, in practice, uh, most successful programs aren't actually bottlenecked by um, transfers between host and device, so it hasn't been something that, um, uh, that we need currently, but um, you know, it's definitely something that we can think about. Any other questions? Well, OpenCL doesn't have hardware specs directly. Um, it was hardware, then the, it was hardware, I repeat for, uh, so the hardware specs, or OpenCL is hardware and software. OpenCL is a, neutral? Is a, is, isn't hardware, OpenCL is, is a programming model. It's an API that you can call to write, and, and a way to write programs. But it has, it's open, it's an open spec in the sense that multiple vendors can write compilers to target their processors. Um, maybe, maybe Tim would be better to answer that question than I, but. Um, yeah, I mean, OpenCL is a, is <laughs> so OpenCL is a uh, sort of a, a, a very low level portable abstraction layer for doing the style of programming Brian's been talking about that runs across a wide range of GPUs and CPUs. So it's all about software, there are no hardware specs. But because it has to be portable across so many hardware devices, it has to expose all that low level detail. And the OpenCL programmer has to deal with it. That's why OpenCL is a much more ver verbose, frankly, CUDA looks clean and elegant compared to OpenCL because we have to expose all that low level detail. But that's what gives it the portability. But it's it's purely software. There are no hardware specs. It's just a software layer. And uh, is it properly open source? Then? Okay. He asked, "Is it open source?" It's open spec. It's not open source. In fact, to my knowledge, there is no. Um, I'm not aware of an open source version of OpenCL right now. So you get it from Nvidia, or AMD, or Intel. Um, so the spec is open, you can go online and download the spec. And there's an excellent, excellent book that just came out about it. If I have uh -huh. right. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it, it, yeah, you just download the spec and it's available from virtually all the main CPU and virtually all the main GPU vendors. So you can write one piece of source code that can run across all of them. Well, let's thank the speaker. So uh, that concludes the talks for today. From uh, what's going to happen now is that we have a 20 minute break. It was going to be a 30 minute, but I figured questions were more important. Then we're going to meet again in 380 Soda Hall.